Hello, everybody. Today I'm joined by Dr. Mark G. Bilby. And today we're going to be discussing Marcion's Gospel and Data Science. So welcome to the History Valley Podcast, Dr. Bilby. Hi, Jacob. Thank you for having me. Of course. So let's get started. So I know that you have a long PowerPoint presentation that you prepared today in which we're going to go over the data science surrounding Marcion's Gospel. I would like you to explain what that is to the audience who are, I suspect, probably all of them are unfamiliar with this. Sure. Well, there's there's a huge movement uh, in academia, uh, in humanities and literature included, even in English departments, to start looking at literature in terms of data science, uh, thinking seriously about quantitative analysis of text, uh, and that can include things like author and voice identification and disambiguation, telling voices apart. So one, one fascinating study uh, that got my attention was by Matthew Jockers. He was at Stanford. He got poached by Apple later, but he proved scientifically that there were seven different authors of the Book of Mormon, not just two as traditionally assumed. And he did that based on stylometric patterns of contemporary writers, who were also important founding figures in the Mormon church at the time. There have been other similar studies on the Federalist Papers, identifying the ones that are uncertain. And even more recently, the founder of QAnon was uh, outed by two different um, research teams working in two different countries, proving from this person's Twitter posts that his style of writing was evident in the uh, in the QAnon founding texts. So. Uh, you know, when it comes to author disambiguation and identification, we're now at a, a threshold point, I think, in broader academics where we can start to do scientific work. So what that means, though, for the New Testament, New, the New Testament doesn't really fit into a lot of those those models. And, and I think a lot of scholars who deal with English only or English primary texts might not have any idea how to even begin to deal with these problems when it comes to Greek. Um, and, you know, might see, for instance, the data is just too minuscule to not not to use a pun for manuscripts there, but too small to to even begin to uh, treat them scientifically. You need you need a, you know, a robust amount of data often. Um, but uh, but Greek is is actually particularly thick as a language. It's it's morphologically and syntactically dense and far more complicated, for instance, than English. So it's much thicker data. And if we can really figure out how to get inside that data, uh, we can start to put things together. And, and what I've found in my studies, and certainly have been deeply influenced by people like Matthias Klinghart, Jason Badoon, Marcus Vincent, uh, I think Marcion's Gospel is actually our earliest repository of significant data signals in what became early Christian tradition. So that's what I'll go through today, how I'm trying to bring together data science and the study of Marcion's gospel to see if we can actually recover the earliest historical strata uh, that underlie the text that eventually became the gospels, but not just the canonical gospels. You know, we have early signals probably preserved in the gospel of Thomas and various papyrus fragments and other kinds of texts. All right. So you want to take us for the uh, PowerPoint? Sure. That's great. I uploaded it already. Uh, does everybody have access to it then? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's you can perfect. start. You have control. You can take us to the next sl uh, perfect. slide. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So there's a little bio on me. So I've taught various places. I have both a PhD in religious studies, and that's a program in Judaism, Christianity, and Antiquity at UVA. For those of your audience who are familiar with David Litwa, we are in the same program and had the same uh, Dr. Father Harry Gamble, um, so you know, had a good experience at Virginia, and then I went on to do another uh, a master's in science at Drexel in library and information science. So that helped me get up to speed on currents and digital humanities, academic publishing, open science trends, um, as well as things like database management and, and these kinds of things. So I've taught a lot of different places, and you know, I, a lot of your speakers, Jacob, are very familiar to me. People like Dennis McDonald, I worked with Dennis at Claremont School of Theology. You know, I've been to conferences with people like John Kloppenberg and and so on. So, um, you know, I, I'm certainly not of their stature in the New Testament world, but um, uh, you know, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm part of the part of the community as well. Um, and then I was also a reference librarian 
both at Claremont School of Theology and then went on to become a scholarly communication librarian at Cal State Fullerton for six years. And there I helped, I authored and helped pass uh, resolutions in the academic Senate for the whole Cal State system that were focused on open access and then ORCID identifiers, which are unique identifiers um, for people for their research products. So I have you know various competencies and try to bring them all together in what I'm doing to to basically do you know gospel studies in a completely new way that that takes science seriously as well as open the open science and open data movements. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, so here's just a, a little visual preview of how busy scholarship has been over the last uh, you know, decade. Uh, Jason Badoon really led the way in terms of taking a fresh look at Marcion's gospel with his English reconstruction in 2013. I'm happy to say that I'm collaborating with Jason. I, I turned his English translation into a Greek edition. I basically did a reverse translation. And Jason is taking that and he's editing that and going sifting back through all of the primary source evidence from Tertullian, Epiphanius, Adamantius Dialogue, and other sources to come up with his Greek version. So that should probably come out, my guess is in the next three to six months. And I think when it does come out, it will be the definitive uh, edition of Marcion's Gospel. And I'll explain why, you know, as we get all, get along. Uh, Dieter Roth published a significant study on Marcion's Gospel, uh, did a great history of scholarship, uh, as well as a really fantastic job of compiling all of the relevant citations and then comparing them with other citations in the literary corpuses of Epiphanius and Tertullian and so on. So that's an invaluable book. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Klinghart came out the same year with a massive tome uh, that did a, another reconstruction of Marcion's Gospel. He had published almost 10 years earlier that he thought Mar in, in an article in New Testament Studies that Marcion's Gospel was earlier, but this was his magnum opus, as, you know, a project he had worked on for 10 years, got massively complicated, uh, rich, and, and really Klinghart did a great job of sifting through all the variants in the manuscript tradition and then tying those and correlating those with uh, readings of Marcion's Gospel attested by uh, the, the patristic writers. Uh, um, Grimaglia came out with an Italian translation based on Klinghart's edition. So it's not a new edition so much as a translation of Klinghart's work, but it's a really wonderful and thorough critical commentary. And it does a lot of really excellent work in the footnotes in terms of philological commentary, including things like word counts. Um, Klinghart, I'm sorry, Grimaglia differs from Klinghart in that Klinghart well, Klinghart thinks that Marcion's Gospel is the first and then the source for all of the canonical Gospels. Grimaglia sees it, uh, Marcion's Gospel is a two-source Gospel, and he sees Marcion's Gospel as an earlier version of canonical Luke, and that both of them represent sort of different passes at appropriating Q material. So Klinghart gets rid of Q altogether. Um, Roth doesn't really integrate Marcion studies in Q, but Grimaglia says Marcion's Gospel actually evidences an earlier pass or appropriation of the Q material. Uh, Andrea Nicolotti, uh, together with Claudio Giannotto, um, Nicolotti, I believe, is at the University of Turin. He came out with his own brand new edition of Marcion's Gospel. Um, it's it's deeply indebted to Klinghart's, but it is a, a fresh, a completely fresh edition um, and, and the newest one. One of the things that sets Klinghart's and Nicolotti's apart from earlier ones is having a robust critical apparatus. So it, it, it almost reads like you're picking up the Greek New Testament where you have all the variants accounted for, you know, or most of them at least in the footnotes. So that's really nice. And then Klinghart just came out last year and a half ago with uh, his English translation of his previous work in German, although this is a revised edition. So, you know, he got some critical feedback um, especially in 2017 in a, in a dedicated issue of the Zeitschrift Fonticus Christentum. And so Klinghart responded to that and updated his work and, and made a lot of corrections um, in the newer edition. So that, that's accessible now to English, English speaking readers um, uh, as well. Again, I highly recommend that work uh, published by Peter's Press. Um, so my, given all the energy and excitement around the Gospel of Marcion, the question that comes up to me, you know, and I'm, I'm a friend of Dennis McDonald, but I'm also influenced by, um, you know, just just doing critical scholarship on Christian apocrypha and other kinds of texts. What if we just stopped doing gospel scholarship as sort of a, 
a discourse in hagiography, right? I mean, even the way we talk, we commonly use the words Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to refer to authors. And we commonly refer to these people as single authors, um, which already is making all kinds of assumptions about the data that may not be warranted at all by the data. And what if what if we could get past the idiosyncratic biases? Doesn't New Testament scholarship, especially gospel scholarship, just feel like everybody's opinion, everybody has a different opinion, maybe some people's opinions align, but it's so radically idiosyncratic. Like, can you actually even do objective science when it comes to this stuff? Um, so th that's what I'm interested in. And I think, you know, we need to approach the problem in a, in a very new way. So uh, one of our first priorities or tasks then is to simply identify all the relevant data. And that's not just the canonical text, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as, as you know, they're known in the canonical New Testament, but also the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, as uh, John Dominic Crossan has forefronted in his scholarship, Marcion's Gospel, various papyri, Justin Martyr, Papias. Let's just take all of the, the Ignatian corpus whatever early earliest state we can recover uh let's take all of that data and 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 deal with it honestly and and see how it's related to each other so, so let's not leave anything out that might be potentially relevant and then let's normalize it so what i found when i look through all of these previous editions of marcion's gospel is they're all radically different from each other they all use very different font and type of typographical conventions. They all use very different indications or, or notation symbols. And so you can't correlate them. Like, you know, in terms of like scientific data, you can't make apples to apples correlations. I mean, I mean in the first place, these are all print works. Like they're not digit, you know, they weren't digital before. Um, they, they might be digitized, like August Hahn's early edition, first edition of the Gospel of Marcion, that's been digitized by the Internet Archive and its partners. So you can go read it but it's not born digital, it's not a digital text. So we're kind of in the dark, like Gospel of Marcion scholarship basically is like doing hand counts still, right? In the friggin' 2020s, we're doing hand counts of words in the Gospel of Marcion, but it's totally idiosyncratic because, you know, there are eight different versions to choose from and which one do you choose or do you make up your own version or it just feels like a big old mess. So what we need to do is just normalize the data. We need to come up with standard data types and data conventions and then re-render all of the text born digital as clean standardized data so we can start making apples to apples comparisons across this data. Um, and basically it's treating this as this data as transcripts. Like if you were to distill every version of Marcion's gospel that every editor has done down into like a transcript that you have to read or perform out loud what would that be? So that's what I've done. So I've, I've published uh, four different journal articles in the Journal of Open Humanities Data. Its editor-in-chief is Barbara McGillivray at King's College London. She's an eminent scholar when it comes to computational linguistics and classics. So it was really great to work with her. These are all peer-reviewed articles. I'm pretty sure I know who some of the peer reviewers were based on comments, and that's fine. But they all got through peer review. Uh, both the articles and uh, I think there are 12 total data sets uh, that were published as part of this. So this is, you know, what I see as one of my significant contributions to scholarship is to take all of this mess of Gospel of Marcion data and then normalize it, standardize it, and allow us to make for the first time apples to apples comparison and analyze them as digital texts and then compare, right? And we'll talk about the significance of that later. The next thing is just simply to analyze the data as data as voice strata profiles and what I would call vocal signal cascades. You might think of it as kind of rivers. We have rivers of data coursing to us throughout history. And it, 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 as it comes to us, it's cascading, right? Sometimes Jack Bull mentioned this in the Ignatian corpus. You have traditions that enter, you know, that exit and then come back in later. It's really, you know, really strange, almost like a river where you have a little bit that goes off and then it reconnects with the main body later. But in the earliest tradition, what I see is almost like a snowball effect happening. You have this like layers or an avalanche effect where the earliest texts are very simple and then you get a new layer and a new layer and a new layer and it just keeps accreting and accreting. It's a little bit similar to uh, Otto von Harnack's whole philosophy of history. You know, he thought Christianity emerged and spread through a process of assimilation and acculturation. So I would say there's, there's definitely some truth in that. Um, 
And then uh, what we need to do is form scientific hypotheses and then prove them using scientific methods. That seems pretty basic, but we're just not doing that by and large in New Testament scholarship. We're just working with really like tired models that nobody nobody finds, you know, uh, that, that, that the whole field does not find totally convincing. Nobody has been able to convince everybody else. You know, there, there's not a dominant school of thought. It's just, again, kind of a mess. So what I tried to do is pioneer a new, a whole new approach and method for doing this back in, this is July of 2020, I released an open access book. And then basically I've, I've uh, evolved it over time. The whole purpose of the book is that I can state my hypotheses right up front. And, and this is just drawing on research method in the sciences and also publishing um, trends, for instance, like the Gates Foundation, they now have this kind of system of peer review where you publish your hypotheses and your findings first, right? Your data, your findings, and then you open it up to global peer review. And then people are invited to respond, right? So it's this really like courageous, you know, unafraid approach to doing science where it's not just two people who might be your friends reviewing your work. You open it up to the whole world and you dare to put your hypotheses out there and then you dare to prove them and then you dare other people to prove them wrong. So that's what this is. It also treats um, academic publishing like uh, software. So, you know, software is version controlled. If you have developers out there, you have to version control your software in order to, you know, track the changes to it and, you know, do get and pull requests and these kinds of things. You need date and time stamps so that things are anchored in history. Um, you know, and, and if you are, if people are reading information science or computational linguistics literature, they'll find that this is now the norm, right? In religious studies, we are way out of, like, we just have no idea what's going on in a lot of broader academics when it comes to open access, open data, and open science as a movement. So this, this book experiment that I'm doing is designed to, you know, put that right at the center of the conversation about the gospel. So, you know, I could have kept this under wraps and then, you know, contracted with a publisher and released this as a blockbuster book, but I decided I'm going to do this as a massive open science experiment and just see how it goes. And now it's, the book is 550,000 words over half a million words. And, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So I, I'm still waiting for scholars to respond. The only person so far that has had the gumption to respond is my friend, Phil Tite, who I've known for years. He just got a position at UVA. So I'm very happy for Phil. Um, but I, really would like other scholars to respond seriously to my work. Um, I did contract out to get uh, covers done for the book uh, just to make it look a little more professional. As a scholarly communication librarian, I helped people publish journals. Um, I think I even advised Robert Price's uh, the journal Higher Criticism. I had a meeting with his editorial assistant to talk about uh, journal publishing and to give them advice on, on what they were doing. So, you know, I've worked in journal production. I've worked in professional publishing of you know various journals and and books um you know helped with claremont press when it was first starting up um so I, i'm just taking this as like using some of my publishing background and expertise and just doing a little bit of my own creative work so uh, this is the cover of the book on the left which just means uh, you know gospel of the poor according to marcion so the whole idea of the book is we need to center Marcion's gospel. And if we use Marcion's gospel, we can actually reconstruct Q scientifically. And then on the right is the back cover of the book. And uh, if you didn't know, there were uh, various woodcuts of uh, collections of Aesop's fables that were distributed in the Middle Ages and, and Renaissance period. So this draws on that and uh, basically plays up the parallels between Aesop and Jesus. Um, because as uh, you know, my reconstruction of Q, which which is so radically new, I call it QN or the new Q, the Neue Quelle. Um, it's Aesop beginning to end. They're, they're Aesop imitations all the way through the text as I as I reconstruct it. So I, I see it as an Aesopian gospel, like thoroughly, um, even before any any other gospel uh, existed. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of the book on the left in its sort of home place of zenodo.org. Zenodo is one of the world's largest open data and open science repositories. 
And then on the right, you can see all the version controlled versions that have been archived through the years, including date and timestamp. So you can actually go back in time and read my earlier versions and then see how the work has evolved over time and see that, yeah, I did make changes. I did make corrections. But to me, that's not a problem at all. You know, that's good software. You're constantly doing bug fixes and you're constantly developing new features, right? Why should a book be stuck? Why can't it be adaptive? So uh, I've actually, in the latest version, I've put a little endorsement of Jacob's YouTube channel. And um, I was just going to do it as a, a, a thanks to any donors of today's episode. If they just want to let me know if they would like their name in the book, I will put their name in the book. And then I'm going to upload the newest version of the book right after this episode. So if you would like a little like shout out in the book, just let me know. And uh, I'll include that. And like 15 minutes after this presentation is over, you'll see your name in this book. Um, uh, so on the left are the articles in the Journal of Open Humanities Data. On the right are the 12, I believe, data sets all together based on uh, of all the editions of Marcion's Gospel. This gives you a sense of what how intricate and involved this is. Um, this is just, you know, one one little, you know, screenshot of one one edition. And so what I did is not just establish a, a base text digital for each one, but I came up with version numbering for each text and then also did full lemmatization and morphological and part of speech tagging. And for that, I used what's called the Bible Works morphology. So it's very commonly used, you know, for a, a software that a lot of Bible scholars have used through the years. They actually went out of business like two or three years ago, but their whole morphological schema, it's very simple, it's lightweight, and it's, uh, it's not under copyright. So it's very easy for and legal uh, for me to use. Uh, but there were teams out, out of University of Pennsylvania and Vatican and so on who were using this morphological schema for various texts, including the Septuagint. Um, so here's what Marcion's Gospel looks like if you compare all the editions, like just in terms of data. If you tokenize all the data, all the words, on the left, H is Han, Z is Zon, V is Von Harnack, TS is Tsutsui, who's a Japanese scholar who worked primarily in German. Uh, B BD is Badoon, R is Roth, K is Klinghart, N is Nicolotti, and M is me. And uh, you can see very quickly that we have massive disparities uh, in the data for, for all of these additions. You can see Klinghart's, for instance, in word count is way higher than Roth's or even Badoon's. But it is fairly comparable to August Hahn's original reconstruction. You can see Nicolotti's closer to Klinghart, but he even pulls back from a lot of Klinghart's reconstructions. Um, you can see that Badoon and I are pretty close. We both plot the Gospel of Marcion maybe around 6,500 to 7,500 words. I think Jason Badoon is the Goldilocks of Gar Gospel of Marcion scholars because he's not too hot and he's not too cold. You know, when I when I look at this data, I see Klinghart and Nicolodi got too carried away. They went too far. They leaned on Codex Bizi too much to try to restore Marcion's gospel. And that's that's partly what led to the criticisms by Grimaglia and Schmidt and others in the literature. Where I see von Harnack and Roth, they're very close in word count and other metrics. Uh, so I see Roth as highly uh, derivative, really, of Harnack's work, even though he focused thoroughly on and the primary sources and did a fresh reading. Uh, there's a lot of times where Roth just goes with what Harnack says, you know, against what what I interpret to be the, the clear patristic data um, in that regard. So, uh, you know, the Gospel of Marcion did not have 4,000 words. The Gospel of Marcion did not have 13,000 or 11,000 words. The Gospel of Marcion probably had about 6,500 to 7,500 words. And I would be interested, you know, Jacob, if you ever have Dieter Roth on, ask him, you know, like, how, how big do you think the Gospel of Marcion really was? Because, you know, there are just a lot of gaps or holes, you know, what Marcus Vincent calls the Swiss cheese approach to Marcion's Gospel. But, you know, if, if, if Roth had to guess, you know, make an educated guess about how long was this text? Was it really 13,000 words, like Klinghart says? Or was it more like 7,000, like Badoon, you know, has? So here's that uh, cascading model I was talking about before, the avalanche model of uh, the development of early Christian texts. I see these texts as multi-stage uh, compositions. They're constantly evolving, and they're constantly in communication with each other. Their signals are bouncing around all over the place. And starting with a flowchart model that's based on, you know, probably largely fictional, hagiographical ideas of authors, that's not how you do data science. You just start with the data. 
So if you look at the data and how it's moving and how it's cascading and so on, I think this is how the data looks. So you'll see I'm sort of, on the one hand, I'm similar to people like McDonald or Kloppenberg and saying Q is a real text and Q is an early text. And that Mark, there was an early version of Mark and it's pretty early, I think, you know, on the whole. I'm in the same boat as Badoon and Klinghart and saying Marcion's Gospel is an early version of Luke and it probably dates to the first century. There aren't really any indications of second century historical developments. I think that the earliest version of Matthew was a late first century compilation that pictured Jesus as a new Moses. I think the earliest version of John's gospel, like like Dennis McDonald has said, is a, a retelling of the story of Dionysus, where Jesus is a new Dionysus. But then I plot and I've published you know, chapters on this. I think Pliny, around, writing around 110, is a decisive moment where you have an anti-Dionysian or a new Socratic impulse that you have this new Socratic layer that's put on these texts. So Jesus becomes a new Socrates in the second edition of John. Jesus becomes a new Socrates in the canonical version of Luke and Acts. And then you get traces of those things, those imitations that work their way into these later versions. And but but I'm in the same boat as Vincent in saying I think these and and David Trobish in saying I think these texts actually came together in their final form probably around the 140s and 150s. And it's not minor changes. There were heavy, there was heavy handed editing going on in the mid second century. And it was probably well coordinated. So I, I see this as really a way to bring together the scholarship of people like Kloppenberg and Vincent, but he also make room for people like Goodacre who would say, you know, it's clear that Luke depends on Matthew for things like the temptation. Yes. You know, because there was an early version of Matthew, and that's where the temptation narrative came from, and then it worked its way into the later form of Luke's gospel. So, it's it's just a very different way of thinking about this. Uh, here are my five hypotheses, and this is where I think we can actually have a firm foundation on the data. I think it's vital here to remember what Marcus Vincent has said that Marcion's gospel is the first gospel to ever get a gospel commentary. Right. I mean, we have manuscripts and some of them we might date, you know, late second, early third century, maybe some around the mid second century, but they're very fragmentary uh, typically. Uh, but the very first commentary in any gospel written was a commentary in Marcion's gospel. I think you have to take that very seriously. That reception is a key to the historical development. It's significant. You know, I've published encyclopedia articles on Luke and the encyclopedia and the Bible and its reception. It's significant to me that you don't even get a mention of Luke until Irenaeus around 180. So, you know, in that case, like we should be calling the gospel of Luke, we should really just call it the gospel of Irenaeus because he's the first guy to actually tell us that this, te this text existed. We only have very piecemeal clues that Justin Martyr had a text like we would consider canonical Luke. And, and we should not be taking little little fragmentary bits that's like less than 1% of a text by the so-called apostolic fathers and then saying, oh yeah, that definitely establishes 100% of the canonical form of the text. That's not a viable position. The reception history would tell us gospel, Marcion's gospel was probably the earliest gospel that was preserved well and then you know criticized and, and spread and so on so i think we need to start with it as as the center of our reconstructions um but when i look at the marcians gospel i i come out with people like badoon i think daniel smith is on the same page grimaglia i see marcians gospel as a two-source gospel so i'm not where Klinghart is and saying gospel marcian has no sources essentially it's just kind of a self-originating composition i see two very clear sources in this, and I, I think I've mapped that out and proved that pretty pretty well. Um, and it's a very simple gospel, so I'll show you this later. So that's hypothesis one. That's the foundation. And then, you know, moving from there, what what might Q look like if we started taking Marcion's gospel as the center and and the the key to re reconstruct Q? Well, how about we start with like parallels between Marcion's gospel and the Gospel of Thomas, or Marcion's gospel and Matthew, especially when the material's not in Mark. So that's my next hypothesis. My next one after that is we should take Marcion's gospel as a serious evidence for the order of Q. You know, there are debates sometimes between whether Luke or Matthew is a better reflection of the order of Q. Well, now we have Marcion's gospel to, to consider as another source. And if it really is earlier than canonical Luke, we should be taking it as the primary evidence for how Q is ordered. And it turns out it largely reinforces. And and we have solid evidence for this because Tertullian basically worked verse by verse through Marcion's gospel in sequential order. So you can just follow his commentary to know what the original order of Q was, uh, by and large. Um, 
And then the next hypothesis is kind of what you do with this gray literature, you might say. When Matthew has a parallel with Luke that isn't in Marcion's gospel, then I would say that is not Q. So those are things we should strike from Q if Matthew and Luke align, but it's not in Marcion's gospel, right? That's probably a later alignment. It's not a Q text. And then when it's unattested for Marcion's gospel, it's probably not Q. So originally this hypothesis said it's not Q, just straight up. Like if it's unattested for Marcion's gospel, it's not Q. That was going too far, but it was a helpful going too far because it helped establish baseline vocal patterns for these texts and then allowed me to circle circle back around and then restore some passages that scholars think are Q passages. And then I, I agree with them, but I only came to that position after establishing kind of the baseline patterns in the data. And then hypothesis five, when Marcion's gospel has a parallel with Luke, and this doesn't apply to everything like the miraculous catch of fish, that's probably by the, the editor or redactor of, of early Luke, um, at least in its, uh, in its early form. Um, but by and large, when Marcion's gospel is a parallel with Luke and that, that doesn't show up in Matthew, Mark, we should take those seriously as additions to Q, like expansions to Q. So let me show you what this looks like in practice. So here's the two source hypothesis worked out. If you start just like labeling Marcion's gospel, and I don't know why nobody's really done this thoroughly before, but from my readings of the history of scholarship, nobody's really done this. But if you just start labeling them, like where did this come from? It's pretty darn clear that the first... 13, 14, most of the passages that start the Gospel of Marcion are all pulled straight from Mark. The one exception being the Nazareth story, which Q scholars think at least maybe the opening part of it was a Q text. I think 23, where he quotes Aesop's fables, and then 29 and 30, where Jesus almost gets thrown off a cliff, just like Aesop all, did get thrown off a cliff. I think those are also part of that Q layer. Um, and even known to the author of early Mark. The next section, well, this looks like a Q section, doesn't it? Except maybe for a few outliers here that we might not know what to do with. Like maybe this sower fable is Mark, maybe the disclosure sayings are Mark, but maybe maybe we should think that that might be Q, right? I mean, maybe we just need a different conception. Maybe Q actually did introduce the sermon on the plane and didn't just start with sayings. Um, that's not too far-fetched of an idea. Uh, and then the next section, wow, it's all Mark. Right. And and in the first one, I didn't even mention like Gospel Marcion is actually more faithful to Mark than Matthew is in terms of the number of passages restored and preserving the order. So, again, this looks like a this looks like a Mark in section, doesn't it? And then this next section looks just like a Q section, like but Gospel Marcion pretty much aligns like 80 percent with Q, with traditional reconstructions of Q. There are differences, but, you know, that's that's reasonable. Um, and then the next section, this looks like largely a Q section as well, right? And what, and what you're seeing here is a lot of the stuff that scholars would say, oh, that's L source. It's not there in Marcion's gospel. And the reason it's not there is because there was no L source. It's a fabrication, right? Scholars later made up to try to explain the stuff that, you know, was in Luke, but wasn't shared between Luke and Matthew. Um, but what we really need is just a, a better and more precise understanding of what the original, the actual Q was. Um, and if you look so look at some of these, like why why do scholars consider like the rich man and Lazarus that couldn't have been Q? Well, why? Because it's a story, right? Q traditionally is understood as like a collection of halakha, right? It's 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 or you know um, ethical teachings, uh, you know logia sayings. But you know what's what's one you know like the main theme or message of a lot of those logia? It's give to the poor, right? Uh, you know, rebuke the rich, rebuke, you know, the wealthy. Well, what's the rich man and Lazarus all about? Like thematically, it's right on the same page as the Sermon on the Plain, right? It's Q themed. And, you know, if you read rabbinic literature, they're very comfortable moving back and forth between halakhic and agadic material. You can have halakha here, and then you have agadah in the very next setting. So the idea that, that the Q document, just because of the Gospel of Thomas has to be just a bunch of sayings, or, or fables or what have you, and it can't have a gothic material, it uh, just doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, and then the last part, this is really the, the big question, like is this Q or is this Mark, right? Is this an early form of Q? And, and this is where even though Klinghart doesn't think Marcion's gospel is a two source gospel, I think Klinghart's absolutely right that these texts in Marcion's gospel are pre-Markan traditions. Like universally, they are simpler 
uh, undeveloped traditions, and they don't really show any inkling or uh, they show minimal indications, let's put it that way, of the Jewish war. So I, I get that's why I put this stuff, uh, you know, by and large, Q, maybe some stuff that's post Jewish war. Um, all right. So if we if if this is on the right track, then what does this do to Q? Well, it does things like get rid of the baptism, get rid of the temptation that those weren't originally part of the Q traditions, as well as a bunch of other things that are typically just taken to be part of Q, but probably weren't. Uh, and then it adds a bunch of stuff to Q that scholars traditionally wouldn't consider part of it. And, you know, I'm not the only scholar these days who has made this case for a, a much expanded notion of Q, including a passion and resurrection gospel. All right. If, you, if I'm on the right track with this, all right, what it would suggest is that there's a class bias in Q studies where, um, you know, a lot of the passages that are really harsh toward the rich and vindicating the poor that they've actually just been completely left out of Q. Even passages like here in Luke 16 that fit thematically right in the vein of Q. Why, why do scholars just leave those out? The faithfulness and mammon passage, the judge and widow, why can't that be Q, right? All of these are indictments of the rich. So to me, that suggests that scholarship for the last 200 years has had a massive class bias and just left a bunch of stuff out that was really just offensive to them because of their own sensibilities, not because you know, it was an accurate reflection of the earliest um, traditions here. And then I also see a massive gender bias happening in Q scholarship, right? You know, people write chapters about, you know, the women in Q, but they're, you know, they acknowledge up front hardly anything to talk about because there's just very few women talked about or maybe feminine imagery, you know, for God or Jesus. Well, what if women were in Q? What if women were there from first to last? What if women were actually defining characters right players in this text what if there's actually a, a female inclusio for the whole thing where the women are actually the first witnesses of the resurrection uh, and women are the first patrons or the first disciples of jesus so the way i'm reconstructing this is that this is absolutely a text that that centers and forefronts women which again that that fits the general trajectory in early christianity is as proto-orthodoxy developed women's roles were marginalized so if if women are talked about as apostles, for instance, that to me probably indicates that's an earlier tradition because later patriarchal structures found that to be problematic and erased it or rewrote um, those gender roles. Um, let's see, let's keep going on. So uh, I did a, a lot of statistical analysis in my book. Some of this is similar to what Daniel Smith and Joseph Tyson have done, but I, I take it to a, another level, looking at passages and verses and word counts. Um, and then just complexifying the uh, the types of passages we're looking at here. So when I break down the, the numbers and statistics, it seems to me that Marcion's gospel is very clearly not a, a version based on canonical Luke, right? Because it's a fantastic witness to triple traditions. It's a really good witness to double traditions. It's a pretty bad witness to Markin passages. It's a horrible witness to Luke and single tradition passages. And it's an abysmal witness to passages uniquely shared between Mark and Luke. That none of that sounds like Marcion's gospel is based on canonical Luke. It all sounds like it's an earlier version of Luke that was later used by the editor of canonical Luke and rewritten and expanded significantly. Uh, and then I, I try to prove this using statistics and, and word counts and so on. So this is going through every single edition of Marcion's gospel and showing that these patterns hold, right? A lot of the literature, you'll see these debates happening with Roth and Christopher Rowe and other people they'll go back and forth and say well you know if you took first two chapters out then you know you, you, can't, you don't really have much of a stylistic case so what i've done here is shown if you look at every single version of marcin's gospel that these patterns are systematically true and valid whether it's hans on harnack badoon roth klinghart even even roth even though he thinks marcin's gospel is written after and based on canonical luke his data is actually pointing the other way because there's a systematic lack of single traditions all the way through that. And that's true of passages. And then that's true of words. If you do word counts, you see the same trend. So here's canonical Luke. You have a lot of single traditions. It's a pretty substantial number. If you just start at Luke chapter three, you have this exact same number of almost the same number of uh, single and double traditions. But then if you look at every single scholars with very different methods and very different conclusions, but they all have the same underlying data pattern 
that shows that single traditions are lacking, right? That is very clear evidence that Marcion's gospel is earlier. The same thing if, if you look just starting in chapter 4, verse 31. So Daniel Smith has done this in a couple of chapters that he's published. The, it's the same systematic variance. It doesn't matter who's editing Marcion's gospel. It has a systematic lack of single traditions, which again, does not point to Marcion eviscerating a text or bridging a text. It points to a text that was later expanded. Marcion's gospel is the earlier text. Canonical Luke is a later significant expansion to that text. Same thing with word counts. Uh, to me, this is the most decisive proof. And, and to my understanding and my way of thinking, it, this is the first time that anybody has proved with scientific, statistically significant findings that Marcion's gospel is earlier than Luke. Right. This moves us beyond just subjectivity or even scholarly consensus building to the point where we now have statistically significant evidence. Right. Scholar. I'm not a statistician right, uh, by training, um, sort of a novice in this area, but I would very much welcome statisticians and, you know, professional data scientists and computational linguists to look over my work and, and validate it or disconfirm it. You know, either way, it's fine. Um, but what I'm finding here is if you do binomial distribution probabilities, and binomial distribution probabilities basically are about establishing what the, the standard pattern is. You know, if you roll the dice, you know, what are the odds that it will be this number? You establish that percentage. And then, you know, you have a count, how many times you roll the dice. And then you have an expected number. And then you have the actual number. And when you put those three, and you can do this in... in um, in Microsoft Excel, I can show you the formula in Microsoft Excel if you want to. But if you just take those basic numbers, like what's the base pattern in canonical Luke? Um, how many times would we expect this to happen in Marcion's gospel? And how many times does it actually occur? What you see is a massive disparity. And this again, this is systematic and statistically significant. So, you know, statisticians usually look for a p-value of 0.05 to have reasonable confidence in their conclusions, right? Which is, yeah, in this case, you know, five to the negative two. Well, if if you look at this, like this entire page of 30 some odd features are all massively scientifically significant, even to the point like, if you got 4.3 to the negative 10, you're talking about a 99.99999% confidence level in your conclusion. So, I could see some scholars coming back on this and saying, well, that's just Bilby. He just, he's trying to, he's massaging the data. He's left out some things like Pross and the accusative, you know, and I, and I go into more detail about this, but um, I'll, I'll wait till the next one. So what I just did this morning, and so this will be released later today. So this, these are brand new proofs that I just worked on this morning. So what I did is I looked at every single version of Marcion's gospel that every editor did use the same technique. What's the baseline number in canonical Luke? What's the frequency rate? So like pros in the accusative, that's unto the preposition pros. It occurs almost like once out of every hundred words. So it's a very high frequency feature. Um, if you look at Han and, and uh, you know, you would expect to get about 122, Han does have 122. So that's not st statistically significant. Zahn and his reconstruction, you expect 90, you get 91, not significant. But then when you come to Harnack, you would expect based on his number of words in the text, around 4,300, you would expect to see Pross and the Accused about 37 times. What you actually see is that it appears 21 times. That is massively statistically significant. When Roth does his version of Marcion's Gospel, you would expect it 35 times. It actually only appears 17 times. That is massively statistically significant. And you know, you could say, okay, well, you know, Roth and Harnack are just doing Swiss cheese you know, reconstructions of Marcion's gospel, they're, you know, like a lot of the speech introductions where this preposition would occur, they're leaving that out. And, you know, okay, okay I'll follow you a little bit on that. But we have other things too. So it's participle pl plus then, right? This, when you read canonical Luke, this is about every 150 words, you come across this, this construction, a participle and then de, which is like now or and or but uh, conjunction, right? So it's a highly repetitive formula in canonical Luke it is significantly under, uh, uh, you know, under accounted in Marcin's gospel, let's say, or, you know, it's, it's not present nearly as much according to Harnack and Ross constructions. Um, the, the participle saying is the same thing, but then you get into things like these are really independent of like speech introduction, things like passive participles. Those have statistical significance. If you look at Roth and, and um, 
Harnax work. If you look at the the word the lemma root arc, which is like you know alpha rho chi, that has statistical significance. The formula say two eris middle participles. You just keep going and going. Behold, and it happened. City. I think Vincent has recently published a blog where he found something similar um, in the corpus as well. People. That's that, that word occurs quite a bit in canonical Luke. Hardly at all in Marcion's gospel, even to the point where it's it's it is statistically significant. Um, the participial form of the word be or become. The word day. And, you know, we see this in other places, too. A lot of chronological references are under present in Marcion's gospel. A lot of geographical refer references, place names. But even things like the genitive articular infinitive, like it's the, you know, it's like the and then the ing form of the verb. Statistically significant, at least, even in Han and Zahn's reconstruction, which usually not, and so on and so on. And that's just the, that's just page one. Here's another page with even more. So the root turn. Right, you read canonical Luke. Jesus turns, Peter turns. People always turning. They're doing dramatic posing. Not in Marcion's gospel. In canonical Luke, people always going here and there and somewhere else and going back and forth and doing a lot of journeying. Not in Marcion's gospel, right? So the more you look at it, the more it's like there's no way Marcion's gospel is an abridgment of canonical Luke. Because you know, if that made sense, it's like a river. Like say you you see a river and it's passing by a coal plant, and you know when it's downstream from the coal plant, there's all this coal stuff in the river. The theory is like Marcion was such an amazing abridger that he went, he took out all the little coal particles, you know, out of the river and made it, you know, some, somehow got rid of all of that. Like it, it just doesn't make any sense when you look at the data. Marcion is upstream data. Canonical Luke is downstream data. All of the sedimentary patterns in this data point to that. Uh, here's another set of proofs. So I, I tagged. You know, like I did close comparisons of Mark and Luke and, uh, you know, like canonical Luke, Mark and Marcion's gospel and, and tried to identify what I call proximity patterns. So it turns out if you compare those three texts side by side with each other, about a third of the time, um, if, if you're and if you look at Marcion's gospel as the base, then uh, Marcion's gospel is closer to canonical Luke than to Mark. If you're doing a three-point comparison, canonical Luke, a third of the time, it's closer to canonical Luke than it is to Mark. Cool. Okay, but then a third of the time, it's closer to Mark than canonical Luke. Hmm, that's interesting. But then if you start with canonical Luke as your base point of comparison, it's closer to Marcion's gospel than it is to Mark almost half the time. But it's almost never closer to Mark against Marcion's gospel. And if you get my drift, that all shows very clearly Marcion's Gospel is the medial text. It is in the median position in this series of relationships. The problem is scholars do these like side-by-side -side comparisons and they're not triangulating in their analysis. And that's what this is about, uh, which gets into my next thing. So throughout my reconstructions, I try to apply signals analysis and uh, triangulating techniques or triangulation techniques. So as I see it, you can distill every transmission of a signal in the gospels down to three different like patterns so you have a direct transmission like a to b then you have a bypassed transmission a bypasses b to get to c and then you have a piggybacked transmission where a goes through b it gets transformed by b and then it goes to c so c picks up the transformed a b signal if you can start labeling every word or set of words uh, in, in the Gospels using this method, right? Triangulation is used in EKGs to find out where you have a problem in your circulatory system. Triangulation is used to geolocate people with their cell phones. Why can't we use triangulation to locate voice strata in time? That's what I'm trying to do. Um, so it's this, you know, I haven't seen anybody try to do this with historical text, but this is what I'm trying. And again, starting with Marcin's Gospel, which doesn't always mean it's the first, so here, like this is one sample passage. This is uh, Jesus calling the 12 disciples. Marcion's gospel doesn't attest to the names of the 12 disciples. It mentions 12, but it only mentions Peter and Judas by name. Now, is that an abridgment? Is that just a skip? Or is that actually a reflection of the earliest tradition? I think it's a reflection of the earliest tradition. So I think this is a pointer to early Mark. Early Mark doesn't have names for all 12 apostles, right? It's, 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 uh, sort of an infant tradition. 
So all they care about is Peter and Judas at this point. Marcion's gospel is very similar, right? And then as you go through history, what you see is these accretions, layers and myths that start to come in, more and more names, more and more genealogies, right? Relationships among the apostles, brotherly relationships and these sorts of things. So, you know, this is where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely influenced by McDonald, but I think he he forefronts a lot of the mythological imitations so that they're happening around 70 uh, when a lot of these mythological layers were were imposed on the traditions, you know, maybe in the 110s, 120s, 130s, 140s, like the mythological layering, it's a gradual process. It's not all just happening like with Mark in 70 or something like that. And then this is a critical edition of Marcion's Gospel. It's a work in progress. It's about like 75% done, but it provides a Greek text, all the page numbers in all the other critical editions of Marcion's Gospel, and then a translation. So this is supposed to be, you know, accessible and scholarly at the same time. I also do a translation of the first Gospels. I reconstruct it, what I call QN. Uh, so this is that, which I see is like a very kind of simple and uh, dramatic text. And I try to render it that way without like all the versification here. And then I have code in my book, right? I'm trying to bring together science and the gospel. So I'm actually open, openly publishing code using R, the R programming language. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Python, but R is more popular and more commonly used in computational linguistics work. So um, I've started publishing that. Uh, let me go ahead and share. I'm going to do a quick code demo, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to share my... Linux box. So we're moving on from a PC to a Linux. Can it, Jacob, can you see that? Can everybody see that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is my Linux box. I'm opening up um, RStudio. So, you know, uh, it's recently been rebranded as Posit, but uh, R is very, very popular. So um, I mentioned before that I published these uh, normalized data sets in the Journal of Open Humanities Data. And as part of these data papers, you submit uh, data sets and then those get archived. So if you go to the Harvard Dataverse, you'll find these data sets, the text and morphological versions of all of these editions of Marcion's Gospel. Um, so yeah, they're, they're there and they're ready to download. Um, you can download them just like you would other files on the internet with a right click and all that. But, you know, in computational linguistics universes, you, you want to just pull data really quickly and cleanly. You don't want to have to mess around with a bunch of files all the time. So what the script does, it started out as just invoking the Dataverse library or package in R um, so that you can just very quickly live pull all this data. And then it concatenates it. It puts it all together. And then it patches the data. So I go through and I correct errors and mistakes that I had made in uh, the original archived versions of the data set. So rather than having to re-release new data sets all the time with every correction, this code basically patches it on the fly. And then I do a lot of reformatting, trimming, cleaning, and organizing, um, You know, making sure the encoding is solid, uh, doing a lot more patching on the morph morphology, um, doing a lot more stuff to clean it up, concatenating it, and then turning it into a massive data frame, which is essentially like a table or an Excel file. I also try to make it really accessible by transforming, at least providing a column where the Greek letters are transformed into English, as well as Greek letters are transformed into unaccented Greek letters, which can help um, analysis as well. And then I do a whole thing. This is using a technique called feature engineering and dimensionality reduction, which are common in data science, right? If you are trying to teach a machine, how do you recognize pictures of a cat? You don't tell it, like, look at 100% of everything, right? Uh, you do want to feed it numbers, right? The way machines recognize images is by every pixel having a numeric value, right? What is that color in hex terms or on the RBG scale? What is its position? That all needs to be encoded as numbers and then put in a massive array, and then a machine can learn how to detect an image. But the way you do it is by feature engineering and dimensionality reduction, right? Feature engineering, you focus in on the things that are unique to cats, right? The shape of the nose, right? The distance from the nose to the whiskers. But you also want to ignore all the stuff that's not really distinctive about cat photos. So 80, 90% of the photo, you just want to get rid of, you want to ignore, or you want to reduce it down somehow. So essentially what I've done here is created out of this, these morphologies, a massive numeric array 
where all the part of speech and morphological and syntactical information are condensed into about 10 numbers um, for each token. Um, so let me just show you this in practice. It's actually like live working code. And this will be um, available in the latest version of my book that I'll upload like 15 minutes after this presentation. So you can see it live loading the data here from, um, from Harvard Dataverse. It's cleaning the data. It's organizing and trimming the data. It's transforming the data and creating new columns. See, this is very fast. This, this is 1,300 lines of code. It took a while to create and to bug fix and all that, but, uh, but it works. And this basically gives you clean Gospel of Marcion edition data that you can use. Now, th these are just like, if you want to invoke a, a data frame and just show like what its elements are, use the str command. So that's what this is doing. Um, yeah, and, and so on. And then this is where it starts to get really interesting. And this is where I would love to work on a team of data scientists and gospel scholars. Like, let's get 10, 20, 30 of us working this. Like, if, if I'm on the right track here, this is a big friggin' deal. But we need a whole team of people working on this. This this needs to be more than just one dude, one weird dude's, you know, pet project or something like that. So once you have clean data, well, what, what kind of stuff can you do with it? And again, this, this is code, nobody's seen this code before, right? Nobody's seen this. So, okay, well, we can count tokens, right? There are the tokens in each Gospel Marcion edition. Okay, that's cool. Well, what else can we do with it? Oh, maybe we can write a little code that shows us what the high frequency lemmas are, lemmata are in this. Okay, the word the occurs a lot. Well, if we, that makes sense, that happens. But it is a little bit different from edition to edition. That's, that's interesting. But then we can get into what, uh, scholars in literature and authorship studies and, you know, text mining are doing uh, natural language processing, voice identification, author identification, right? Did you know, like, J.K. Rowling wrote a book and she wrote it anonymously, and it was a scientist at the University of Washington, I think, who discovered that she was the one who wrote it and proved it scientifically, and then J.K. Rowling admitted it, right? One of the main techniques they were using was called TF-IDF, term frequency inverse document frequency. And it's it's a fairly simple mathematical formula that lets you just identify speech patterns within a text and you know delineate one text from another, but also delineate between authors. So I started, you know, this is actually just stuff I was just doing this morning just for, you know, kind of shits and giggles. Um, again, like a team of people needs to work on this. This this is not just me. This this can't just be me goofing off and doing this kind of stuff. But uh you can establish, okay, here's how many times the lemma occurs in a given edition. Here's how many total lemmata are in the text. And then you can like run the ggplot function um, and graph this stuff. So over here on the right, now we have term frequencies in a histogram format of the most frequently occurring lemmata in Marcion's gospel. And then we can start to do other analyses like find, oops, what would just happen? Yeah, press the wrong button. Um, let's see, is that already done? Yeah, it's already done. Wow, that was just super, super quick. So uh, this is like, if we wanna know what the, the most unusual words are in Klinghart's edition, like what words does he use more than other Gospel Marcion editors? What are his his peculiar tendencies? Like what, what does he tend to use? Okay, well, ani, that's interesting. He uses the word to be more often than any other Gospel Marcion editor. He uses the word sister more often. He uses Martha more often. Okay, that might tell you something. Protoclesia, the first seat. So we're already getting a sense like, okay, Klinghart's edition is different, and here are the elements that make it different. Um, I'm supposed to be reviewing Klinghart's book for a journal called Vigiliae Christiani. Um, I might do something like this. I'm still kind of uncertain about how to write a journal review when I'm interested in quantitative questions. Um, if anybody has any advice about that, I, I'd welcome it. Um, Anyway, th that's just a sample of some of the kind of coding stuff that we can do. Um, but there's there's a lot of potential here um, I, I, that I hope you hope you see. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a bunch of other things I'd like to say, but I think I'll I'll just leave it at that, and then we can we can get to the questions. That was a lot, Jacob. I just I just it was like spoon feeding with a forklift. <laughs> yeah, I had myself muted there and uh, still didn't realize that. But um, yeah, I was saying right now we don't have any super chat questions. 
I'm trying to remind people to super chat their questions or PayPal them. So um, I guess I'll ask you this while we wait. Okay. Were the Gospels significantly shorter in the first century, in the first century CE stages of the development? And were, and therefore, if so, would it follow? Would it be fair to say that most of what we see in the four Gospels were added to them in the second century CE? Yeah. Um, establishing the exact length of the earlier forms of the text is pretty difficult to do. And I, I haven't got to that point yet. Like, so I can't say with any confidence exactly how long early Mark was, exactly how long, you know, early Matthew was. I, I'm just not there yet, but I'm working toward that. I'm trying to show using like these new methods and scientific techniques um, what that is. But I, th I think that's a, that's a really large question. I think just the base idea that these texts were shorter and that they were gradually expanding and evolving. That's the key point. As long as we're there, then let's have an open conversation about how we can get more precise with our methods. Um, so I was telling Jacob just yesterday, you know, like Google, if, if our, the listeners aren't familiar with it, Google has something called the Ngram Viewer. You can go to it right now if you want to. And it's based on all of the work that they did with uh, you know partner libraries to digitize all of these books from the last several hundred years. And what they did is they extracted words and phrases from that and and basically created a massive database that's searchable so what it lets you do is look at voice patterns over time you can look at the you know type in the word groovy and you'll see like not very few people were using it probably in the 1950s and then all of a sudden in the 1960s that word took off got really high and then it probably went down some in terms of its frequency and use in literature right in the 80s or 90s something like that right so you can see how words and language evolves over time what we need is something like that for Greek, right? So projects like the TLG at UC Irvine and other projects um, really should be developing a Greek ngram viewer tool that lets us do and, and uses texts that are really solidly anchored in history, like texts written by Roman governors, um, you know, statesmen, philosophers, where we know these people really well and we we can anchor their, their or, or epigraphs uh, that are dated. Let's let's use the stuff that's really solidly anchored in history. Let's establish vocal patterns by not just by century, but by decade, because language is evolving. And then let's establish regional language patterns. And once we have a really rich environmental linguistic database from which to pull, then we can start having a much better sense of exactly what was the content of the early, you know, version of, of Mark, right? What, what was the content of the early version of Matthew's God? We can look at internal evidence and we can compare it with the other gospels, but we also need to look at massive environmental data, right? If we're going to get objective um, in this. Marcus Vincent mentions in his book, Marcion Invadating the Synoptic Gospels, that Tertullian appears to admit, in his opinion, that Acts of the Apostles was a response against Marcion's antithesis. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, that's that's an area that I have not looked carefully at. I haven't done a close reading of the antitheses. Um, I've done a close reading of Tertullian's book four of Against Marcion and you know, used Roth's work, but then went back myself and, and looked at all the um, the citations, quotations, allusions to Marcion's gospel. Um, but I didn't start by looking at the antitheses. I didn't I didn't start by considering Marcion's biography or his theology. Um, I just started by looking at what I would say are the vocal signal data that Marcion or, I'm sorry that Tertullian attests to for Marcion. So I really. And, and I think this is a scientific point of view. I, I don't think it's a reasonable scientific position to start with the biography of a person that was later considered heretical and to use all of his detractors from 40, 100, 200 years later. And, you know, uh, especially when they're all depending on each other and they're just, they just, it's like a cascading 
you know, array of insults that are being leveraged, you know, and launched at Marcion. Um, I'm partly influenced here by R. Joseph Hoffman. So in his book on Marcion, which, you know, is before Vincent's work, he cast serious doubt on the whole idea that Marcion, you know, came to Rome in the, in the you know, 140s. Um, because to Hoffman, it just sounds anachronistic. The idea that in the 140s, you have Rome as like the center of Christianity, the center of Christendom. That just doesn't, go together with all the other evidence we have about kind of the multipolarity, you know, the multiple centers and, you know, urban, urban centers for the spread of this movement um, and its texts. So, you know, I, th I think it fits sort of Catholic historiography, but it doesn't fit Orthodox historiography uh, necessarily. Um, and it, it doesn't fit, um, you know, just the patterns we're seeing from, from other texts, the idea that Everything's in Rome. It's everything centered out of Rome. Rome is the center of authority. I mean, yeah, it was the capital, but, uh, you know, of the empire. But I don't think that meant that this marginal movement that had many faces and many locations, um, that they felt any need to, like, visit Rome and, and travel and, you know, come to account there or something like that. That, that to me, has the, the feel of later legend. You know, like the stories about Peter being killed um, and Peter's tomb, uh, you know, his mar martyrium in Rome, let's date from the late second century. So a lot of the stuff where it's like, it's Peter and Rome and Rome is the center of everything. Like Rome's a beautiful city. I've been there. It's an amazing place, but you know, the traditions are late second century traditions. They're not mid second century traditions about, you know, a, an established universal Petrine authority that's based in the location of Rome. How different do you think Mark's gospel was at the time that Marcion was writing his gospel, like the, the version of Mark he used? Yeah, how different was it? Um, I think it was substantially different. So um, it's it's hard to go through every example, um, you know, with the time that we have. But um, what I'm seeing, and I think this aligns a lot with what Vincent has seen in the text, uh, is that that um, what we call Mark underwent a sub substantive redaction in the middle of the second century. And that is probably partly what gives us the so-called longer ending, even though there are actually multiple longer endings of Mark's gospel. There was a, a Mark 16 conference just in this last year uh, that Claire Cliva and, and uh, Mina Monier put together, um, looking at uh, all the manuscripts of Mark and showing that there are actually not just two endings, the shorter and the longer, there's a middle ending, like a medium sized ending as well. And then just lots of different versions of the shorter ending and the longer ending. So it's way more diverse and eclectic than scholars usually let on. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff in Mark's, you know, and and in that later ending, you know, I think you have a distillation, of course, of of earlier traditions like, you know, the, uh, you know, drinking poison and, uh, you know, handling snakes and all this kind of stuff. That's probably partly indebted to canonical Luke and Acts um, for, for that tradition. Uh, but there are lots of other things that were significantly expanded. So like the story of the Gerasene demoniac, the way I read it is that was massively expanded. Um, uh, the parable of the sower, the the sort of the, the longer explanation of that, um, where it's, you know, it's kind of a, an in-depth explanation of the parable and, you know, th that the word is the seed and all of this. That's probably a later expansion to Mark. And when I read that, it sounds a lot like Justin Martyr who's writing in the 140s or 150s, right? His, he has this theology of the Lagoi Spermatikoi, the spermatic word, the, you know, and it's sort of middle platonic, the word that goes out and inspires and illuminates people all over the place. The, the Mark and explanation of the parable of the sower sounds a lot like that, where I think the earliest version of the parable of the sower is probably referring back to things like dynastic succession, um, seeing Jesus as actually a royal figure and possibly married or or at least partnered with Miriam and having children and then hiding that child um, quite possibly. I think the early version of Mark is more interested in things like dynastic succession in the line of Jesus and James with the parable of the sower. Uh, and I think Revelation actually is recounting some of this about the woman going out to the desert to hide the child. Um, so yeah, I think early Mark is is more concrete and it's more interested in like revolutionary politics around 70. But the expanded version of the parable of the sower is concerned with middle platonic philosophy 
in the in the one forties. The story of Jairus's daughter, same thing. It's an inclusio. It's built around the story of the hemorrhaging woman. Marcion's gospel has hardly any of that, but and and Mar, you know the early version of Mark probably had a minimal story about the woman with the hemorrhage you know hemor hemorrhage problem of hemorrhaging. Uh, and then the story of Jairus's daughter is kind of put put around that as a like a doubling of the story, and you have all these parallels in terms of the ages and you know gematria and so on. That's probably all mid second century stuff. Um, and I, I you know I don't want to speak out of turn, but um, I showed Austin Bush who had written a chapter on the Gerasene demoniac and its imitation of Cyclops legends, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm you know I'm fairly convinced by your redactional you know construction of that. So that was that was nice to hear. Do you think that the Gospel of Mark used the Q document as a source as the free document hypothesis suggests? Yeah, I think the early version of Mark is responding to some of these, actually many, many. I, um, the way I'm reconstructing it, it's, it's not just things like the Beelzebub controversy where early Mark is responding to Q um, or, you know, everything, uh, you know, hidden will be disclosed, uh, various logia. Um, it's, more, it's more than that. If, if Q is QN, if Q is a passion narrative, then early Mark ac actually was taking its cues. It's not just its logia cues, but it's agotic cues uh, from, from this earlier um, story about Jesus. But I think also responding to it, right? And, and actually radically revising it. I, I was listening to James Tabor's um, uh, interview with you the, the, this the other day, and and uh, he was talking about you know how Mark is like this rad, radical, you know um, sort of anti anti logia maybe tradition, and I, I think there's actually a lot of validity in that. Um, so if Q, for instance, has women followers as the very first followers of Jesus, and women as the first witnesses of the resurrection, what does Mark do with that? He erases them completely, right? And he takes the story of you know, um, the story of the woman anointing Jesus, which I think is really just like making him the Messiah, right? Anointing him. Uh, it's a woman who makes Jesus the Messiah in Q. Uh, it's not, it's not John the Baptist at a river. It's Miriam, right? And the very first anointing story that's in, in Q as I've reconstructed it. So it's a woman who makes him the Messiah. Mark flips the script completely, and Jesus is made the Messiah by John, you know, essentially by God the Father um, you know, as a male figure, through John the Baptist, a male figure. So I see Mark as a like a radical rewriting and challenge, actually, to Q as as evidence of our of the earliest like women followers of Jesus. We have a super chat question from Extra Music. Thank you for your super chat. Late including Mark passages copied by Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke copied a late or early Mark. It's, uh, yeah, at the start of the presentation, I was talking about how even just the names, Matthew, Mark, and Luke really are just not serviceable. They're, they're legends. They're not part of the text themselves. Um, and so that's partly why in the Open Science book, I just started using abbreviations or customs like LK1, LK2 to refer to an early version of what we call Luke and a later version, MT1, MT2, MK1, MK2, MK3, and, and so on. So um, you'd have to kind of go back to the, early, the start of the presentation, but um, the way I see this is that we have a massive cascade of vocal signals and they're all pinging off of each other. So it's not one whether one author used another author. That's just not helpful. That's just using hagiography. That's using legends about people who purportedly wrote these things as if that's a legitimate data science point of view, and it's not. We should just be looking at the data, and uh, the data is going from strata to strata. So what we need to do is identify the strata, and then we need to break apart each signal transmission and signal cascade. That That's what gospel science should be it's it's not conversation about which author did what even though what i showed before with those statistically significant features not only did that show that marcin's gospel is the earlier text that it's upstream and canonical luke is downstream and has all these sedimentary deposits that are just not in marcin's gospel marcin was not picking all the pebbles out of the river to decontaminate all the 
Lucan redactional features out of his text. Um, but yeah, it's it, these are all evolving texts basically. Uh, but it also shows that's uh, what I showed you with the scientifically significant, the statistically significant findings um, is showing that it, it actually is um, a picture of the voice of canonical Luke, the redactor, whoever that person was writing in the 130s or 140s. Um, what I just showed you was like a snapshot, a, st a scientifically based snapshot of that person's vocal patterns. That person, for instance, when they speak, right, they, they had a text in front of them, Marcion's earlier gospel, early Luke. And in that earlier gospel, when Jesus speaks, he said, it, it always, it's, you know, typically it says, Jesus said to him, Jesus said to them, Jesus said to him. And it uses in Greek, the case called the dative. In Luke's, in canonical Luke, or LK2, as I call it, Jesus very seldom uses the dative, right? J speech is very seldom introduced with the dative. All the time, speech is introduced with the pros in the accusative form. So it's not Jesus said to them, Jesus said to him. It's Jesus said unto them. Jesus said unto him. Jesus said, un and it happens every hundred words. It's a recurrent pattern. So that voice, the guy who keeps saying, Jesus, you know, unto him, unto them, unto them, as a, you know, almost as a tick. That's not Marcion's gospel. That voice is not in Marcion's gospel. That's a later, and that's not Luke. That's some, some person, some proto-Orthodox scribe or what have you writing probably in the 130s or 140s who's doing that. So it, we just need to get past this whole, did Luke use Mark? Did Matthew use this? Did it, th that's just talking about hagiography. That's this, that you're using legends to try to do science and you're just not going to get anywhere using legends. You just, we need, need to start using data. Speaking of, this actually brings up, I brought up this with Jacob yesterday. When I looked at Luke 14, one through six, it's the story of the man with dropsy, which some Q scholars have restored for Q. I, I think that that doesn't make any sense at all based on the linguistic patterns. But when I reconstructed the signal transmission patterns in that story, what I said, what I found is it's a lot like the longer ending of Mark in that it's a pastiche. It's pulling from a lot of different earlier strata and recombining them into something that, you know, is, it doesn't, doesn't really fit. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't really flow with the narrative in any kind of meaningful way. So in an earlier version of my book, I speculated, you know, maybe this guy with dropsy is actually the patron to whoever's editing canonical Luke, you know, in the 130s or whatever. And and then I, I went, uh, let me let me show you this. Um, the screen's still being shared, right? Can people see my screen or not? Do I have to do reshare it? I can, I have to add it back in. Yeah, let's add it back in real quick. Let me just show people this yeah, real quick. It's up. So this is the, I'm gonna propose a novel theory right now, and I'm happy to be disproved, but no, again, I'd, I'd speculated that whoever edited Canonical Luke, um, you know, had this dropsy episode in Luke 14 as a, a tribute to the patron of the work. Well, then I came across this text in Cassius Dio, who's writing in the 170s, so it's well after. But, you know, who was famous? Who was like the most famous case of dropsy in the second century? It was the Emperor Hadrian. Right, Hadrian had an awful case of dropsy, and no doctor could cure it. And he tried to even commit suicide. He tried to get a barbarian to help him commit suicide, but he couldn't be cured of the dropsy. And the, how he dies, according to this account, is many by saying this fable, this proverb. Many physicians have slain a king, like no no physician can heal him. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get cured and he couldn't find a peaceful death, you know, in the process. So here's this the story of the most powerful person in the late, you know, or in the like second quarter of the second century. He's a, like the most notable case of dropsy at the time. And here's the story in, in canonical Luke about Jesus as the only guy. And it, and it situates the story in the house of the rulers. Right. It does say the rulers of the synagogue, but the house of the rulers, if you just take that part and just say, OK, well, the synagogue is probably like that's to add a little bit of historical verisimilitude. Right. That's like make it sound historically plausible. House of the rulers, a guy who has dropsy and can't be cured by anybody. Darn, that sounds just like Hadrian. 
could it be that Theophilus is Hadrian, right? That's what makes the most sense to me now. I don't, you know, I don't see any reason to think Theophilus is a real person. Um, we don't have any, any, you know, evidence of that that I've seen that's significant. But the idea that this was a text written in honor of Hadrian and is an appeal to the Emperor Hadrian, well, that fits right in line with what people like Justin I, Mart Martyr are doing. I just got to ask, do you think that the original version of Luke or an earlier version of Luke went out of its way to point out it was written to Hadrian instead of Theophilus and then somebody else replaced his name with Theophilus later? Uh, I don't know. I, that, that would be only speculation on my part. I just know, you know, Theophilus means God lover. Um, it, that that would be a very easy, um, you know, uh, honorific to give to somebody. You you want to call the emperor pious and religious. Emperors saw themselves like that. They saw themselves as pious people. So God to say, you know, this is dedicated to you, God lover. That's yeah. To me, that's it's kind of code for you know signaling to the emperor, you're a devout person, and you will. You will read this and you will take this seriously, we hope. All right. We got another super chat question. And uh, X Music, thank you for your earlier super chat. Renzo Rodriguez, thank you for your super chat. Will you use AI in your work? Uh, I, I can't say I'm an expert in artificial intelligence. Um, you know, like I, I'm familiar, for instance, with like chat G, G, GPT, you know, I followed that a little bit and its evolutions and just tried it out myself, you know, when I've. I think the first day or two it was released, I went and played around a little bit with with it. Um, but what I'm doing, it's it's meticulous, uh, like largely manual labor. I'm trying to automate it as much as I can using R scripts. Um, now R has a bunch of machine learning and AI potential for it. So once the data is really solid and cleaned, and other people are using it, I think there's potential for AI applications. I've reached out to some people who are experts in AI. And, you know, by and large, the sense I get is they're not really interested in the synoptic problem or the earliest history of, you know, the evolution of, of you know, what became Christian texts, um, just because it's just not what most data science or, you know, scientists are interested in. So, you know, their whole data science competitions, I was invited to be a judge of one. I suggested, hey, let's, let's, as part of the data science competition, let's try to solve the synoptic problem using scientific methods. And, you know, I was told like, yeah, it's not really the focus of the conference. Um, so there's just a divide. You know, it's kind of like there was a big division between classics and religious studies 10 years ago. And people like McDonald have helped bridge that gap and bring us together. Um, you know, there's right now a real big gap between people doing AI and machine learning work and people doing religious studies, biblical studies, although that's changing. You know, I've, I go to digital humanities presentations where they're talking about, you know, scribal identification of the, the scribes, you know, the scribes who, uh, some of the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls or Ethiopic literature using handwriting patterns, right? Um, that's that's a cool AI um, potential. So I, I would love to see that. Um, I haven't seen that yet, and I haven't used anything, I think, yet that could be considered AI. But I think what I'm doing are stepping stones that could get us to that point where once you have normalized, clean data for everything, you can start to do some cool AI stuff with it. But yeah, I don't ask chat GPT what I should think about Marcin's gospel because <laughs> it, it doesn't know what, what to think about it. So I got to ask about the gospel of John. A lot of scholars think that the gospel of John is independent of the synoptic gospels, but some will, but some others will say, actually, the gospel of John did make use of one two or all of us or all three of the synoptic gospels yeah what do you think about that and how does john's gospel relate to marcion in your view yeah um so i have a chapter about this i edited a volume responding to uh, mcdonald's works um it's called um greek models of the gospels and acts so i have a, a chapter in there um that it's called redactional layers in luke and act i'm sorry redactional layers in luke and john and so in that i basically try to trace the history of the evolution of the gospels and the strata formation partly using mimesis criticism using what mcdonald has done but but noting like some layers are tied to certain points in time so i think the dionysian imitations start in the 80s in marcian's gospel right so marcian's gospel you have the story and that's in luke 5 of the miraculous catch of fish that's 
one of our earliest, like very clear Dionysian signals from a Homeric hymn. Then you have the first edition of the Gospel of John, pro probably, I think I'm, I'm close to what McDonald would say, the first version of that's probably around the, the 100s. And then you have Pliny, and Pliny starts killing these people called Christiani, which I think just means Messianics, or like you might say like Jewish Christians, but I think just Jews who are Messianic. Um, Pliny starts killing these people around 110, and he accuses them of practicing Bacchanalia. He accuses them of being Dionysian. And I think that is what leads to a massive shift to a Socratic mythological layer being imposed in canonical Luke, Acts, and then the second edition of the Gospel of John. So I see back and forth happening. I see evolutions happening, you know, across time. But I, I think these editors knew each other and they were circulating these texts broadly. So, you know, to me, it's not, it, it doesn't help to start from the whole. It, it's much better, you know, to look at the the signals themselves is to focus in on specific traditions and passages and try to see how they evolved. And there are certain things like the baptism. It's, it's unmistakable that, you know, what became canonical John is deeply in conversation with the baptismal narratives that we, we find in the canonical text, even though there is no baptism, it's still very much in conversation with those narratives. Right. And certainly then resurrection, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, and, and various other stories too. So, yeah. Since you brought up Theophilus being Emperor Hadrian, I've got to ask, um, and yesterday we did talk about this a bit privately about Roman provenance, the view of uh, the Roman government being either somewhat or largely involved in the creation of the religion of Christianity. Um, do you see a lot of Roman propaganda ideas in the New Testament when you look at it? Yeah, the way I read it is, um, I read it as second order um, Roman literature in its final form. So I, I think early on, it's coming very much out of a Jewish matrix. I think Q, and again, I think I'm in line with a lot of uh, other scholars too, you know, Q represents Palestinian or Galilean, maybe a little bit of Judean traditions, but it, it aligns with Jewish social trends, Jewish halakhic teachings, you know, a lot of stuff in Q reads like Pirkei Avot or the teachings of Hillel um, in Jewish tradition. So I don't see any reason to say like, you know, Q was Roman propaganda. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, th I, th I think it's the other way around that it actually represents like a resistance movement. You know, people who like if, if Aesop is the dominant like controlling myth or legend of the Q materials, the way I've, I'm reconstructing them. Well, who, who was Aesop? Yeah, he was Greek, but he was a slave, right? And he offended people. Uh, he, you know, was proved himself more intelligent than his master and rival philosophers. And, you know, he got himself killed by the Delphians, um, you know, these sorts of things. So, and, and, you know, Paul is even later stylized as an Aesop, right? When in the Acts of Paul, where he talks about Paul being snub nosed and stuff like that, those are Aesopian illusions as well. So um, I see the earliest traditions and, and Aesop was very popular in rabbinic literature. Um, so the, I, I see the earliest materials as coming out of largely a Jewish matrix. But then I think this is kind of like Harnack with the mission and expansion of Christianity. As this movement grows, they try to appeal more and more to more and more people. And that includes people in the upper echelons of power um, around the empire. And then that's where you start to see, you know, I, I would say, I would call it sort of government adjacent literature. I wouldn't say that this is official propaganda of the Roman state. And partly the reason that I think that is, you know, I was a student of Robert Wilkin who wrote, you know, the Christians as the Romans saw them. And, you know, what, this, some of my best memories of, of grad school was reading Porphyry's Against the Christian or, you know, Julian's Against the Christians um, or Against the Galileans, you know, more technically, Celsus, right? So when you read all these early critics of Christianity and, you know, the or proto-Orthodox and Orthodox tried to destroy their memories and destroy their texts, but in battling them, they largely preserved their texts. I, I would encourage people, if you, you haven't read, 
Joseph Hoffman's editions of Porphyry and, and Julian, you should definitely do that. So these are very brilliant people. Julian's the emperor, right? Um, they, these are in the upper echelons of power. Um, you can read Jerome too. You know, Jerome, he has a dream where Christ rebukes him for, you know, being more of a Ciceronian than a lover of his gospels and such. So from a Roman point of view, the gospels are not good literature. They're not elite literature. No Roman governor or philosopher in his right mind would say that this was produced by the Roman government. They wouldn't. They saw it as base literature. They saw it as substandard. It wasn't, it was doing literary imitations. And that's where Dennis McDonald's work is so important. But this is not nearly on par with somebody like Virgil, right? Or Cicero or somebody like that, or even Pliny or Hadrian, right? The, or Tacitus or Switon. Their sophistication level and intelligence is at a completely different level than what we find in the canonical New Testament text, which is not to say they're not beautiful, that, but it doesn't have to be a government. You know, you can have literature that's produced by the Biden administration today, and you can have literature that's produced to appeal to the Biden administration. Those are two different things, right? So I, I, I see the canonical text is more like a Justin Martyr's text, right? Or a Thenagoras or other early apologists. These are texts that are aimed to appeal to people in power with a blend of critique, response, satire, and ass kissing rather than official products of the Roman state. Again, no, no decent Roman intellectual of the day or in the centuries afterward would have considered this to be anything close to serious Roman literature. They, they wouldn't. What do you think about Professor Robert Eisman's claim that um, Paul was a Herodian? Yeah, um, I think you and I were getting into that a little bit yesterday. It's not something that I yeah. really thought a lot about. And I think one of the projects that needs to be done, and I'm not the one doing it currently, but maybe Marcus Vinson is and other scholars are. I, you know, Ulrich Schmidt has done a lot of work on Paul's letters as it relates to Marcion's apostle or apostolicon. But I think Schmidt has it backwards, you know, just like I'm, I'm showing with Marcion's gospel being the earlier text. Um, I think it's the same thing with Paul's letter. Marcion knows an earlier version of Paul's letters. And when you start looking at that, so again, I, I have not carefully looked at that. I need, you know, I was looking, for instance, at the reference to the family of Herodias in Philippians 4.22 that I shared with you. And I, I haven't even looked at that in Badoon's book yet to see where he comes out on that question. But if I had to guess, I'd say Badoon probably is where Harnack is and where there is no reference to Herodias's family in Philippians 4.22. It just says, greet all the saints. That's all it says in Harnack's version. So the way I would put that together again, like as a non-expert, I'm not an expert in Paul's letters or Marcion's apost apostolicon, but what I'm seeing curs cursorily is that, um, you know, a lot of these political references and like, you know, examples of political ass kissing going on, those are in the canonized, the later version of Paul's letters, and they're not in the, the earlier version that Marcion knows about. Well, I think we could stop there. I don't have any more Super Chat questions waiting right now. Okay. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on today. This has been a great conversation. And uh, I'll see everybody later. I think I think the couple of people that super chat today. And I'll see everybody next time. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.